Ask any of the underpaid and underqualified people working inside this AT&T store what the letters AT&T stand for. They won't know. Do you? Yes, and if that AT&T employee is particularly clever or smarmy, they may say something like, AT&T stands for integrity and customer service. No, no, no. What you want them to tell you is just what the letters AT&T stand for. They'll stare at you as if you just asked the stupidest question ever. And working in a phone store, they've heard some stupid questions. So never mind them. Do you know what the letters AT&T stand for? Is it American Tech and Telephone? Amherst Telecommunications and Technology. American Telephone and Telegraph. So that's right, it's Telegraph. Telephone and Telegraph. Before smart guys figured out how to send the human voice over a wire, the telephone, they had figured out, around 1832, how to send blips over a wire. Clicks. Specifically, two different kinds of clicks, a long one and a short one. Somebody took the alphabet and made up a code for each of the letters involving sequences of these clicks. So messages could be spelled out and sent over a wire, one letter at a time. What was the name of the person who thought up this code? Ashley Thornwhistle, Samuel Finley Breeze Morse, Hillary J. Squarepants. Well, it's got to be the middle one, right? Who would make up a name like that? So yes, it's the middle one, Morse. And what do we call his code? Is it Samuel Code? The Hammurabi Code? Morse Code? Now, if you don't know this one, I guess this stuff is all new to you. You could work at AT&T. It's Morse Code, of course. And the system for sending this Morse code over wires was called telegraph. Telegraph is a word concocted from two Greek words, the first of which, tele, means far off, at a distance. The second word, graph, is a word that means writing. So telegraph means writing at a distance, like a letter, but faster. What the Greeks originally meant by this word graph, or graphia, was cartoon drawings of political figures with exaggerated features, to scrape or scratch on a clay tablet with a stylus, a quill pen. Yes, this was a hard one. The correct answer is the scraping and scratching on a tablet, and it came to mean the process of writing or recording something. So, in the 19th century world, telegraph was high-tech. All of electronics as we know it traces its roots back to the telegraph. Then, in 1875, there was a Scotsman up in Canada who figured out how to send the human voice over a wire, a kind of acoustic telegraph. That guy's name was Alexander Graham Cracker. Alexander Golden Grahams, Alexander Graham Bell, and that's right, it was Bell who invented what came to be known as the telephone. You knew that one. Telephone. There's that Greek again, tele for distance and phone for voice or sound. And so as telegraph is writing at a distance, telephone is voice at a distance. We can all be grateful it was Bell who invented the telephone. Why be grateful it was Bell? Because his cousin was working on the same idea, and if the cousin had been first instead of Bell, then the sound a telephone would make when somebody called would be very different. What was the cousin's name? Mortimer Graham Siren. Phineas J. Shriek. Gertrude Piercingwine. Yes, that was entirely a trick question, based on nothing more than a pathetic quest for laughs. Uh-huh. 
So we see that communication over a wire was a really big deal in the 19th century, about the highest tech thing going. But there was a dream beyond that. Smart guys and gals dreamed of communicating at a distance without wires. And the pioneers in this effort, like Heinrich Hertz in 1886, succeeded in getting pulses of electricity to go through the air without wires. Hertz thought this breakthrough meant which of the following? Electrical distribution could be done without wires, or radio broadcasting could be achieved, or nothing. He thought it meant nothing. And the answer is, when Hertz was asked what practical applications might be made of his discovery, he answered that it was of no use whatsoever. Nothing. But it wasn't nothing. It triggered experimentation by scientific types around the world and was the basis of what they soon began to call radiotelegraphy. But they may as well have named it infectious mononucleosis. The public was no way going to use the name radiotelegraphy. The name that caught on with the public was wire-free, wireless, mono. Yes, it was wireless. And that's what radio was called in the early days, wireless. The word radio comes from the Latin word radius, meaning beam. Radio was not a word used alone at first. It was used as part of which word combination? Radiophone, radiotelegraphy, radio receiver. And the answer is all three. Boy, this is a tricky quiz. Yes, all three combinations were used around the turn of the 20th century, before the word radio was ever really used by itself. Radio became, eventually, for most people, an entirely passive thing. By the mid-20th century, about the only way regular people had any say in what came on the radio was to call the radio station's hit line and request that the disc jockey play Brenda Lee's record I'm Sorry and send it out to Frankie because you are so sorry and won't do it again and won't even look at Tommy anymore or let him carry your books or anything anymore, you promise. But in the early days of radio, it was not yet known that it would turn out this passive. It was thought that it would be more of a two-way thing, a point-to-point -point thing, rather than a central broadcaster to mass listening audience thing. For some, it still is a point-to-point -point thing, often referred to as two-way radio. Which of the following is not two-way radio? Ham radio? Pork radio? CB radio? Yes. Pork radio is entirely fictional. Tasty, but fictional. Ham radio refers to shortwave communication via one's own radio equipment, often capable of reaching other people thousands of miles away. And CB stands for Citizens Band, which was all the rage in the 1970s, and still exists, of course, just not as a rage. Now let's go back to 1910. What did it mean in 1910 to Marconi someone? To send a message by wireless? To buy someone an ice cream cone? To drop pasta into someone's pants? Of course, the tech answer is the correct one. You knew that. But what does Marconi mean? Where does Marconi come from? The ratio of capacitance to inductance? The name of the man considered the inventor of modern radio. The path of an electron in an atom. Guglielmo Marconi, born in Italy in 1874, is considered the inventor of modern radio. The other two answers are gibberish. Marconi was not gibberish. He was the guy who turned radio from little more than a parlor trick to a viable enterprise. Until 1895, no one could get radio waves to go further than a half mile. By 1902, Marconi had managed to send and receive radio signals spanning the Atlantic Ocean using his devices and techniques. Sending messages wirelessly turned out to be especially useful for Boy Scouts.
ships at sea, blackjack dealers? And the correct answer is ships at sea. The Marconi wireless system was installed on ships such as the Titanic and the Carpathia, the ship that came to its rescue in 1912. Many lives were saved that might otherwise have been lost had it not been for the work of Marconi. One of Marconi's employees, David Sarnoff, saw a future not so much in two-way radio or point-to-point -point radio, but rather in point-to-mass radio broadcasting. Sarnoff, in 1925, would found and head the first radio programming network in America. Name that network. The Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS. The American Broadcasting Company, ABC. The National Broadcasting Company, NBC. And the answer is... <laughs> NBC, which remained for many years the largest of the American radio networks. Sarnoff founded NBC as a unit of RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. He would become RCA's president in 1930. But just before that, in 1929, Sarnoff engineered the acquisition by RCA of a company in a business other than radio, a company in the record business. This company was the largest U.S. manufacturer of records and phonographs. What was the name of that company? The Victor Talking Machine Company. The Edison Reproducer System, Inc. Or Gramophone Recorded Media and Apparatus. The Victor Talking Machine Company is the answer. And RCA became known as RCA Victor arguably the first media conglomerate of the electronic age. RCA Victor was a major player in network broadcasting, the record business, and the radios and record players to play it all on. RCA Victor, in 1955, paid how much to buy out Elvis Presley's contract with Sam Phillips's Sun Records? $14 million? $35,000? Or neither. He was traded for Yogi Berra. And the answer is $35,000. Cheap. Very cheap. Yogi Berra, so far as I know, did not sing. As for RCA's $35,000 price to get Elvis, if you thought that consolidating companies into huge corporate conglomerates made them more generous, well, I guess not. In theory, I guess some might think that it would. But as Yogi said, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs>